Okay. Now we're 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 gonna we're gonna take time now to uh, improve on the pastor's sermon. That's <laughs> I thought it was in depth more. Expand. Oh, oh yeah. Tim said I should use the word expand rather than improve. Um, it is, it, but it is the point. That was one of the points I was going to make that there, there are two miracles that are recorded in all four gospels. The resurrection is, it is the one that does you know would first come to your mind probably. Um, but then this other one is the feeding of the 5,000. Um, so there is something about it that each of the gospel writers felt was important enough uh, to include it in their account. Each account is slightly different. Um, I would say that John is a little minimalist in his, in his presentation of the story. Um, Others, uh, the one we read today uh, was the Matthew account, um, gives a little bit of an idea of a day full of healing. You know, what went on? Why, why were the people with Jesus out there? Um, uh, Tim is handing out. But, but anyway, the, the, the point is the... The circumstances were Jesus finds himself with a crowd. And the, the different gospel writers discuss how that, what was going on with that crowd, probably teaching and healing, probably for the most part of a day or maybe even two days or so. And by the end of the time, the people were hungry. Um, and then we get the interchange that's in the Gospel of John. So let's let's go ahead and read what's there, so we don't shortchange. Even though I said he's minimalist, we we'll, let me get my mouse to work. We ought to at least tell the story. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy food for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. I'm going to stop there, but the story doesn't quite end there. But um, let's back up to the top. Um, the people were following Jesus. Uh, he was working miracles, and he and John gives a, that account in verse two. They saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. So one reason why people were following was because he was a miracle worker. It was a good show. It was exciting. Some may have been following because of his messages. John doesn't really tell us why, except for this line about they saw the miraculous signs. Jesus in verse three goes up on the mountainside. He, he, perhaps he's trying to get away from the crowd. Perhaps he was maneuvering to get in a position where he could, his teaching could be amplified. We don't know why he went up on the mountainside. And then another we don't know is what's the mention of the Passover feast? 
it's just a sentence. It just pops up. The Passover feast was near. That's it, the difference, I think, between the timing, <clears throat> what we covered last week between John 5 and John 6. If we're trying to get a chronology. Not next day, it's okay. That, Some time had passed. As I said, we don't even know how long he had been teaching with this crowd of people. But Jesus looks up and, and sees the crowd. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to say no, Tim, because it's so early in the gospel. It's just too early for it to be the last one. Yeah. Well, careful now. The, the, the last Passover would have been Holy Week. So it can't be that one. So the one before that? Okay, well, why does that bother you? Because I think this is coming down toward the end of the Oh. Okay, I'll have to. Well, John down to a sign. Because the first chapter was in the beginning. Well, now it appears later. Okay. In the Gospel of Matthew that was read this morning, Jesus looks up and sees the crowd of people, and it specifically says he had compassion on them. John doesn't say that. He, he, he just sees the crowd, and he asks Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Well, let me suggest that he asked Philip, not the accountant. Because you're, you're saying that uh, Judas was Judas. the accountant. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, commentators have asked that exact question. Philip is from Bethsaida, which is in the area. So perhaps he turns to the guy with local knowledge. Um, it's also, uh, maybe Philip was the one, we don't have any evidence of this, one, but some commentators said, maybe Philip was the, the, the logistics guy. Yeah, we, we, it, so maybe Judas kept the purse, but, but the guy who could figure out how, this was a crowd of people that moved around with Jesus. And, and maneuvering all of that, finding food and, and obtaining a place to stay. When Jesus comes in, he brings an entourage. And so, it's, so maybe Philip was the one they turned to for that kind of knowledge. But, and, and Philip engages his skill. Notice, he does a quick calculation. He looks at the crowd and says, well, gee, okay. But, but even then, he's, he's being very inadequate. A bite is what he says. Eight months' wages only buys a bite. In my Bible here, it says 200 denarii. I mean, if that is eight months' wages, that, that's happened in Pennsylvania, I was thinking about $50,000 income. I figured it was anywhere between sixteen dollars and $32,000 for 20,000 people. <laughs> okay, you're thinking. That's right. So you're thinking like Philip. He, he, he's trying to solve the question that Jesus asked. Um, but notice the scale is so inadequate. He, he was calculating how much it would take to give each person a bite. Um, What's the time? I mean, here you are. They're already seated. Well, and, <laughs> and where is the local? Also, maybe Philip knew where the local Costco was. Because uh, assume for a moment that you had $32,000 in your pocket. Where do you go to buy enough food for 5,000 people plus the women and children? <laughs> Nobody. Even the local Costco would not be able to handle that sudden influx. Of, you know, I, I see. Here's my checklist. I need this many loaves of bread and this many fish. It, it's just not going to work. Um, the so question. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think the guys were getting used to not responding quite like that. But 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 it is interesting that he he, he does 
Philip does engage. Philip is engaging a natural solution. Yeah. What if I really did try to buy food? His next question would have been, well, where would I buy such food? But, but he never even gets there. It's, the numbers are overwhelming. They don't have that. Well, okay, to put the best, yeah, say it politely. That's right. Yes, or, or in other words, it is impossible for man. It, it's, man does not have a solution to this problem. Um, yeah, over to you, Lord. <laughs> now, Andrew is an interesting character. He's the one who invited Simon and Peter to come see because he said, we've found the Messiah. Um, and, and so Andrew now shows up with this poor little boy. Um, the little boy has offered his lunch and he's a poor little boy. We know that because of the nature of the lunch. Barley loaves were poor people's food. It was low end. This was a this this was a poor kid's lunch basket that had been identified. And the fish. Now, Tim and I joked about the fish uh, in the movies that we've shown the fellowship, and they, these were big, healthy fish. At, they also happened to be. They were still flipping. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, did you did you eat fish breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Oh. That that's what I was gonna get at. These were these were small loaves that we would might even might call them a biscuit or yeah, something small. It was poor person's oh uh, back to the fish. It was not this big floppy fish. It was it was more likely a small fish. Well, I was thinking even smaller than that, like a sardine ish. But it's the kind you would put on a piece of bread and eat. Anyway, but it is interesting that Andrew says here, we, we've got five barley loaves. Um, <laughs> well, we know the story. We, we know the story and we know what Jesus does. But remember, these guys haven't seen him multiply fish before. They've seen him produce a miraculous catch, but this particular miracle is new to them. Um, and so it is interesting that Andrew has in mind, well, I'll offer what we have. And Jesus can make something of that. Uh, it's more natural for us to think that way than it would have been for Andrew. Um, Jesus now takes over. Jesus says, have the people sit down. In the other Gospels, again, we get a little difference. He, he has in some, I don't know which one, he has them see, sit in, in uh, groups of 50 and 100, which, yeah, wh why? Uh, well, maybe it had to do with the distribution. Um, it, it does it does it turn out make it easier for philip to count them if you've had them sit down in ranks um but they sit down and this is where the number five thousand come and as the uh, it comes and as the pastor said this morning do note that it says five thousand men besides the women so how many so you've got to you've got to put in grandchildren so you've got to put in a multiplier how many of the men had their spouse and how many couples brought their children? It, it, you could pick any number. I've seen numbers as high as 15,000. I've seen one of the 20,000. 
Okay. Yeah, it, 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 scripture tells us, and, and this is traditionally known as 5,000. This is the feeding of the 5,000. But we know, we know the number is the low end of the range. It's, it's many more people. <laughs> only men count. As the pastor said this morning, only men count, right? That's what you said. I, that's what I heard you say. Did not count. Okay. <laughs> now, he he. Jesus takes the loaf. Oh yes. Absolutely. He he. I we're obviously just teasing. The, the the verse eleven has an important piece. Jesus does give thanks. He offers the, the standard blessing before a meal. And then it says, and you picked up on this too, Pastor. I wanted to, I wanted to concentrate on it. They get, he gave, he distributed to those who were seated. And then the sentence, as much as they wanted. I would think the normal person in Palestine at that time did not have the experience as our as the pastor described that they don't know anything about a thanksgiving food coma that we experience you know we 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 often find ourselves having too much food the opposite is true for them they they have rarely had an occasion where they had all they wanted this was a feast yeah, it was a feast, but but it was a poor person's feast. It was based on barley loaves and small fish. Yeah, this could have been the best fish ever served. Okay, thank you. The best bread, barley bread. Okay, I, you bet. I hope it was good. I, beautiful salmon. <laughs> nice uh, dough reduction sauce. Oh, wonderful. Not one complaint. Well, see, it is interesting that Jesus took what was there and multiplied it and didn't produce out of thin air, which he could have. Yeah. Just he, he, if he can create a miraculous catch of fish, he can create whatever banquet. He wanted on that hillside that day, but he didn't. He multiplied barley loaves and fish, provided a simple meal, but the advantage of it was it was abundant. People actually said, no, thank you. I've had enough. And that would have been, I, I'm just saying, was a rare thing for them. They rarely I had that. <laughs> well, no, actually... That's a, that's a different direction. Uh, Pastor, you mentioned that he, one purpose is he wanted them to stay. Um, the way John tells the story, um, we get this strange idea that they are going to come and take him by force. And, and so the John story, I actually I didn't go back to look to see what the Matthew story does, but John implies that Jesus kind of has to break up the event and send his disciples off across the water. He goes up on a mountain because the people were going to, what does it say, take him by force? Okay. Yeah. The crowd, absolute mob, more than New York City was <laughs> After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, the prophet refers, as I mentioned over on the right, Moses says that God promises to send another, another prophet like him. So when you see uh, the, the Jewish people referred to uh, with a capital P, another prophet with a capital P, this is that special prophet. So the, the, the Jews who were there that day saw this miraculous food miracle and thought, well, this must be it. This, this must be the guy who's going to restore Israel. 
and all of their normal Messiah thinking kicks in. The Messiah is the guy who's going to come and kick out all oppressors and reestablish the Davidic kingdom. He's going to be the new king of Israel. Political Messiah. The, they, they definitely were had in mind a political Messiah. <laughs> well, except no, next year. Uh, um, and they're also looking for the healing Messiah as well. That's why they are really over there. Yeah. It was to get healed. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so they imagined they imagined the, the the general on the white horse. Yes. So so notice uh, Jesus uh, is, is verse fifteen knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force. As I point out over on the right, that doesn't mean, that doesn't say force Jesus to be king. It means start a revolution in which Jesus becomes the king. The force would have been applied against the Romans. Uh, okay, no. Yeah, yes, so, so I, the way I see this one, is he calls a quick halt to this? Okay, I, I don't, I don't want to go down this road ever, you know, at least not until the second coming. So, uh, so this is just not the way I want this to happen. So the way he stops it is uh, sends his disciples across the water, and he goes up onto the mountain to pray. And I guess the people just melt away after they've had their big, big dinner. So, so that gets me that get, but that gets me to John's. That's John's account of the same miracle that we heard in the sermon today. Uh, is there anything left to discuss there? Um, uh, miracles. Some of this, um, as you said, Jesus Right. Yeah. Also, the you know you can use the same same logic with the disciples themselves. Jesus didn't have to have the twelve disciples involved in the distribution. He could have he could have had a lap tray appear, and everybody's you know they're all sitting there in the grass, and suddenly there's a there's a. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, I, I meant helpers at all. Jesus chose to to provide this miracle through the hands of helpers, um, so they got to see it. And I like to think also, by the way, it's those helpers who really saw that it was a miracle. They were the ones that knew that we started with five loaves. The people didn't know that, but the the helpers did. And the little boy knew. That's true. Good point. Good point. And and that, and as they started to distribute, they were the ones that saw that they they never ran out. Imagine that feeling. You've got a basket, and it's it's got some loaves in it. You may not even be able to explain how there there are more than five in your basket because you started with five. But anyway, you've got a basket of twenty, and you're walking into a crowd of people. And you're distributing your 20 loaves. And they it never runs out. You just keep distributing. Now you've you've handed out a hundred loaves when you only had 20 to start. So I think the helpers got to see the miracle actually happening. Um, well, that's why Bill, Bill's probably right. It, it's probably the larger group of helpers, it's not just the 12. Although the the Bible does tell us there were only there were twelve baskets at the end, it doesn't say how many people were actually. Yeah, Jesus later is going to separate the twelve from all yeah, the yeah, other. that's right. So all those other ones, I think, were okay. Impressed. Any other thoughts on the on the miracle feeding? Why is this? Why is it all, all, all Why is it that important? 
John, John counts it as one of his signs. That's one answer. When you look at a sign, though, don't just look at a sign. Call to the Lord and say, Now enter into the city of Lent. You don't stop at a sign and say, Well, I'm here. <laughs> you enter. The point is, you enter yeah. the city. Right, yeah. right. And of course, the point of this is to illustrate something about the bread of life. Up. That was Pastor's point. A lot of time. Yes, yes, yes. So, what does it say about the Jesus responds to the devil man doesn't live by bread alone. Um, so, it's the spiritual food that's being provided. One reason why Jesus backs away from this crowd is what they wanted was a daily feast. What, what, what they imagined was if he was king, we would never have to work again. We, we, would, we would have miraculous meals. It's a, it's a selfishness of earth. I need this, I need And that. what Jesus is offering us is spiritual food. And that's the jump to hyperspace. The hyperspace warps people that they never make. You say they, the crowd, the crowd. The people, people are stuck on their stunts. They want to make them king partly because they yep. want to keep going. They also want a constant source of food. Yep, food every day. Yeah. And yeah. Jesus gets into eating his flesh, drinking his blood. There you must be convinced he burns for us. And they don't. The Pharisees don't. This is the problem. Okay. This because we're running near the near the first. We're not necessarily done, but it's getting on eleven thirty, and I use that as my first. Yep. Sig- we'll beep beep. Oh yes, we're gonna we'll continue to work in, but I, I I do want to talk about what happens next. The disciples head off across uh, the Sea of Galilee, and and the storm whips up. And you've all heard stories about how easy it is for storms to whip up on the Sea of Galilee. So, and they were so they were trying to make progress into the into the wind, and they were not able to do it. Uh, remember, at least half the guys were fishermen, so these were, these were experienced boat handlers, and and they were not able to get more than whatever three miles or three and a half three and a half miles in, across. So they they were not making great progress, and judging by the timing here, it had been most of the night. Imagine that rowing a boat for most of the night. Uh, presumably they worked hard all the day before so so i would think they are near exhaustion at this point um you might wonder why they they didn't let the wind just take the boat back and they start walking around it is it's not impossible to walk around the top of the sea of galilee and and get where you're going anyway christopher Columbus wants to say go you go okay um verse 19 this is there's not a lot of development here. They're, they're halfway across the lake. They saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. Um, why are they terrified? Jesus' supernatural power over gravity. Okay. God's nature. It, it, the, yeah, it's both of those answers right. say the same thing. He, this is this is way out of their experience, right? Okay, it, people don't walk on water, so Jesus must have power. Didn't didn't they see the power that afternoon? He created the food. Well, but I'm not sure that they knew Jesus. The first thing he said was the Messiah. Okay, fair enough. So they see this being 
walking on water and I'm not sure who it is. I it was a ghost. I to see that. And one of the other one of the other gospel writers says because they thought it was a ghost. Yeah, that I I um I've always been confused by that. I don't know whether ghosts are part of Jewish yeah. thinking yeah. in the first place. It so seems strange. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm saying that those aren't the same thing. Ghosts are spirits of dead people. Right. Demons are not the spirits of dead people. They are fallen angels, right? right. In our understanding of what's the hierarchy, heavenly hierarchy. Um, anyway, I just, I've never associated Jewish, J Jews with ghosts, but okay. They it's possible that the demons are not demons, but they're spirits of dead people. Yeah. 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 I thought, I, I, I think you could be right there. I think the word is spirit. They saw a spirit and one of the translators whoever you know turned that word spirit into ghost but but i <laughs> living living this is the final act of the night him and it also conveys to the jewish pharisees that deceives president that he is something different than a living possible king uh, okay except i, I what, th that's right in, in, in this story they they'll tell others uh i i think it is a story about the power of jesus definitely in this case the power over nature um but it suggests spirit suggests spirit spirit rather than a new king human like David yeah, but be careful in our in our theology though Jesus is one hundred percent man and one hundred percent God, but the point is that he's one hundred percent man, so this man is walking on the water if it was if see it, w it wouldn't be a miracle if he was a spirit, him walking on the water is not miraculous. what makes it miraculous is he's a man however, that's not the way. The present Pharisees saw it. Well, they saw it as a spirit. Well, I don't know. I don't know what. There were no Pharisees in the boat, so I don't know at what point this story would have even been told to them. Um, Nicodemus was supposed to be there, wasn't he? No, no. Well, I not in this account. Not in this account. No. Nicodemus is a friendly Pharisee, that's true, but but he's, I, I don't know how close he was a follower. His day job was working, his day job was working in the Sanders. Yeah, yeah, he, he was, was in religious yes. peace that was supposed to be keeping an eye on him, well, according to the Sanders. He had a day job. He worked with the Sanhedrin, I don't know, he, but the, John does not put anybody in the boat but, but the disciple. Anyway. They are afraid, and I think it's because of the power. Um, it, it may be they're confusing him with some other spirit, uh, but Jesus is, is exhibiting extraordinary power here, and they are afraid of that. I think this is more like the Son of God power that he's trying to well, and the, and the, rather than the ghost. Now, th th this doesn't say it either. I, I didn't go look in which, which gospel writer, but in the other well, some other gospel, when he enters the boat, the men worship him. Can you help me with that one, Tim? You're usually good with chapter and verse. It's either Mark. <laughs> Thank you. It's either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, he said. Yeah, okay. But the point is... And I've said this before, the, yeah, the idea, the idea that any Jew 
would would bow and worship to a man is phenomenal. For them to worship Jesus is a big step because it's if it's not true, it's blasphemy. Well, the temple was for worship. Yeah, you worship God in the temple. You do not. You do not worship God in a boat. Now, now a couple other things in this in this boat. As soon as he enters the boat, the storm stops. But notice also the, there's a, a hidden miracle. The boat is immediately on the other side of the lake. So not on, so not only not only does Jesus uh, able to walk on water, he has somehow mastered hyperdrive or, or be, beam me up Scotty kind of stuff. He, he's able to move the boat from approximately halfway across the Lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, uh, to the other side. So um, that's a, another miracle, all because of who he is. Now, John doesn't go any further. Yeah, let's make sure um, on, on that issue for today. We're going to pick up with John after, after these two miracles. Uh, the other one that's missing that most people find a good story is the whole uh, uh, J Peter does not step out of the boat in John. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting both Matthew follow up the story with the with the same with story. the same miracle. Let me when you put them together then you see the whole difference. Just like from this one that we were showing. Now the Passover feast is near. John has that passage. There's nothing about it. What's John got in mind? Yeah. yeah. Why is there the little boy in, in this in, the, in this story? John's story. It's a little differences. It doesn't always give me answers, but it always draws up some really. It shows what I think the author is emphasizing for the spirit that God gives him the right. Yeah. I just don't always understand what the yeah, yeah, that's oh, right. I know. That's right. You you do have to read the Bible as a whole. That's right. It's interesting. I I like to think of these guys telling their part of the story. Now with the with the Holy Spirit working with them, but but each one of them, see, as witnesses often do, see different aspects of an event. We see that in in just our human life today. If you have witnesses to a crime, that you, you don't get the same picture. You, you get different witnesses, and and so these guys had different experiences uh, because of their slightly different relationships with Jesus, and so you would you would expect their stories would have different elements. Um, so anyway. Um, it's nice that Wine Street is paid. Amen. I don't understand. What different? Just putting it out. <laughs> Local improvements. Was was there a time when Lime Street wasn't paid? I, I I'm. No, I like got on Duke Street this morning. I'm oblivious. Yeah. Leave on oh, leave on now. I know now I know what it is. It is being I, okay. Yes, ah. for me, I have to go back to the square, and, and mm -hmm. still, you're just inching along because there's construction everywhere. It's just a nightmare. now, now I got it. A night, and instantly, they were there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are going to close as we always do. With the Lord's Prayer, I'm just changing. How does that go again? It goes like. Our Father. It goes. You could, the Gospel Writer's Version. Well, we find the Lord's Prayer in Scripture. Matthew 6. It's not what we're praying. For sure. Oh, because of the doxology, yes.
Yes. I was just messing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dissension. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the divine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. That, that is not in uh, it. It's interesting in that in that one sense, the Catholics are more biblical than we are. Yeah. They stop. You can always tell in a congregation. Well, Luther's going to have a few disagreements with you, sir. Well, <laughs> if it's oh, yeah. Anyway, we're we're on we're on to the final part of this. Please join me in praying the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Speaking of uh, the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer, um, I've never seen a small catechism that doesn't have that doxology in it. But obviously, go back 500 years, the Protestant Lord's Prayer would have been the Catholic Lord's Prayer, which would not have had the doxology. So when was it added? Do you have any idea? I was under the understanding and of course misunderstanding on my part that 